This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello and welcome back to the Rebel Author Podcast, episode 17. Today's podcast is a good one. It's a no bullshit, hard talking, home truths episode. You might not like everything you hear today, but it is the truth. And I'm hoping it's going to give you a swift kick up the backside to refocus and drive harder towards your writing goals. I know that's exactly how I left this episode and I'm hoping it's going to do the same for you. So who the hell is this wicked talking author I'm mentioning? Well, today's guest is Becca Syme. We cover mindset, what you need to stop doing in order to succeed, and we also get to the bottom of what it really takes to be a successful author. But first, to last week's question. Last week's question was, how do you intentionally learn or improve your craft and the business of writing? Angelia Hunter Irizari said, I read more in my genre and I read books for writers. I think that is one of the primary ways most of us learn um, and develop our craft. I know I certainly do that. And uh, with some of the tips that Gabriella gave me in last week's episode, I've also now created my own uh, folder as well for all of the tips and tricks that I am picking up from all of the books that I read. Ritu agreed and said that she reads a lot, so her mind is immersed in writing and she will read writer craft books too and she tries to write something daily. I think the writing daily thing is an interesting one. Not everybody needs to write daily, um, though obviously having and establishing a good writing habit is paramount, whether that is three times a week, five times a week or seven times a week, whatever works for you. So last shout out this week, Author Gloria said, my favourite takeaway tip from today's episode, which was the Gabriella Pereira episode 16, uh, was creating your own anthology. She often highlights section in her Kindle and takes notes. When she's finished the book, she'll email the notes to herself, but that's the most I've done with them. Today, she's going to get a binder, print off her Kindle notes and make them easier to find in the future. Thank you, Sasha and Gabriella. Uh, you are most welcome. And I also uh, went away, like I said, and I have now created a folder too. And I've started to stick in all of my notes, but there are so many <laughs> that it, it, it's going to take like a whole afternoon to sort them out. So, so on to this week's question, which is what do you need to quit? I know for me personally, it's probably the negative self-talk. I am pretty good at beating myself up at every single opportunity. So um, even though, you know, I will achieve loads and I will get stuff done, I, I, I still will beat myself up that, you know, I move the goalposts on myself and that is not a good thing. It's not good for your mindset. It's, it's just not good, but I seem to do it anyway. So for me, yeah, that's me confessing, feeling awkward, but the negative self-talk has got to stop. So that's what I need to quit. I would love to know what you guys need to quit. The book recommendation this week is twofold. So I have recommended this one once before, but uh, the book I'm recommending is our wonderful guest, Becca Symes, Dear Writer, You Need to Quit. I can't remember which episode I recommended that on, but I have recommended it once before. The second book I am recommending is Dear Writer, Are You in Burnout? Becca mentions both of these books in the episode, and I know um, I have read Dear White Writer, You Need to Quit, but I am going to go and read Dear Writer, Are You In Burnout Now? after uh, some of the amazing revelations that she gave me in this episode. And the links to both of those will be in the show notes. So in personal project news, I am imminently getting the Anatomy of Prose back. By the time this airs, I will have the Anatomy of Prose back. And early uh, feedback from her seems to indicate that all I need to do are some minor structural changes, which is fine. The hardest bit of creating any non-fiction book is always the structure. And that is why I try not to say how many steps my book's gonna have until I release it. Um, so yeah, I think I have now a launch 
date, but until I get the book back from my CP, I am not going to announce it just because I want to see what the first couple of days of editing feel like, look like, uh, just to see how long I think it's going to take me to get it to the point where I'm going to hand it to the editor. And once I know that, then I will release the launch date and I might even put the pre-order up, which is very scary, as you can tell by my crazy voice every time I speak about pre-orders. Okay, so listener rebel of the week this week is Tom Fowler. Tom says, years ago, when I worked in retail, our new regional manager came to visit the store. This was an announced visit, so like you do in retail, we made sure the store looked great for his arrival. He came and told us all how great things were, how he looked forward to working with us, that we'd be partners going forward, etc, etc. And I believed it. Later, I carried some flattened cardboard boxes to the warehouse. He was back there yelling and screaming at our store's manager, general manager about how terrible things were. He even kicked some empty boxes, punched a few plastic pallets. Generally, he was behaving like an infantile jerk. Needless to say, I don't think I was supposed to witness this. Our GM was mortified, of course, and she'd done a ton of work to get us ready for this. So when the regional manager confronted me about being in the warehouse, I told him he should lock the door if he didn't want people to witness his tantrums. <laughs> Can you imagine saying that to your regional manager? <gasps> the balls you have, sir. I'm so impressed. Anyway, I shall carry on. He looked confused. I guess he could have continued being a prick and fired me on the spot, but he stopped acting like a child, promptly wrapped up the conversation and left. The incident really taught me people in positions of power will often lie to those under them. I think I had an inkling before, but this moment really drove it home. To this day, in my fiction, protagonists are mistrustful of power and those who wield it. What I love about this rebel story, aside from the fact he gave a massive fuck you to the system and to the boss, which we all know I have a problem with authority, um, is the fact that it influenced and had such a great effect on you that it has influence your fiction going forward. And I, I love that. I love that these rebellions can have such a lasting impact on us that they then influence our stories. If you'd like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, big or small or somewhere in between. You can email your rebel story to rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or tweet me at rebelauthorpod. No new patrons today, but as always, I would like to say a deep, deep thank you to all of my current patrons for joining me, supporting me, supporting the show, and for helping to ensure that this podcast continues. If you'd like to support the show and get access to all of the bonus essays, posts, audio, blooper reels and content, you can from, a li from as little as $2 a month. If you'd like to support the show, then visit www.patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. And that's Sasha with a C and not an S. So one last announcement before we get on with today's episode. I am delighted to announce that the Rebel Author Podcast has its first official sponsor. Kobo is sponsoring 12 shows over the course of the next year. And if you are not using Kobo and you're an indie author, what are you even doing with your career? Um, you need to get on Kobo. I adore Kobo. I actually have a complete Kobo episode where I interview somebody from Kobo all about how to generate more sales coming up in the next few weeks. And I can't wait for you guys to listen to that one. One of the other things that I love so much about Kobo is that they are a personal company. You always receive a reply from a real human, unlike some platforms who will remain nameless. <clears throat> and everybody at Kobo wants to help you succeed. I have often emailed questions and received responses from extremely senior people in Kobo telling me how to solve an issue or how to generate more sales. The last thing that I wanted to mention is that they have a promotions tab, which is exclusive to authors selling on their platform. You cannot advertise on there if you're not on that 
platform or you can't use their promotions tab anyway. So make sure you email into Kobo and ask for that. Right, I'm going to play a clip from the sponsor and then we'll head straight into the interview. Hi, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Tara. And we're from Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors, and our team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world. Our author-first approach is why we built our promotions tool, an easy and affordable way for you to market your book directly to Kobo readers right in the KWL dashboard. We post upcoming Kobo sales, many of which are exclusive to KWL authors. We offer lots of promos that don't require you to drop the price, because we know when you're publishing wide, it's a pain to coordinate pricing across multiple retailers. Are you using free as a marketing strategy? You can submit your books to be featured on Kobo's free page, which gets a ton of traffic. If you're a KWL author and don't yet have access to the promotions tool, email us at writinglife@kobo.com and we'll get you sorted. We're all about providing stellar support. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and find us on social. You can create your free account at kobo.com slash writinglife. We hope to see your books on Kobo soon. Happy, Happy writing! writing. Hello and welcome back to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I am with Becca Syme. Becca is a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach with a Master's Degree in Transformational Leadership and 13 years of experience coaching organisations, individuals and writers in success systems, strategic alignment and self-leadership. She teaches the Write Better Faster course and coaches the Strengths for Writers programme. Becca lives in Montana with her wine-drinking cat, I need to ask her about that, and a 360-degree three, uh, view of the Rocky Mountains that belongs in a Brad Pitt movie. I wish I could see that view. Right? <laughs> welcome, yeah. welcome. Um, Thank you. Tell me about the cat, because... <laughs> so, yeah, he's hilarious. Um, I am a person who... I don't drink out of stemmed glasses. I drink out of, like, the ones you set on the, you know... And he will come and put his face in every single glass. And so I had wine out one day and he just started drinking it. I'm like, dude, (laughs) that's alcohol. And he's just like, oh, it tastes so good, you know. (laughs) And so now it's a joke with all of my friends that like my cat drinks wine because he'll just stick his face and everything on the counter so how was he afterwards how did he, i mean did he stumble was he drunk I, or? Ooh, like <laughs> and it's weird because i'm not sure if he didn't metabolize it or if he just didn't drink enough um because you know how cats they lick and it's like you know you don't even know if they're really getting water yeah um but he didn't drink a ton of it and like i've tried <laughs> This is so awful. I've tried other alcohols. So like I've tried to leave scotch out and like rum and stuff just to see. Yeah. And he only drinks wine. Like he doesn't like wow. anything. A man of harder. taste. Which is yeah. So weird. yeah. And so is he a red wine drinker? White wine drinker? Does he have white. a preference? Yeah. White. He okay. does not drink red wine. I've mm. tried. Mm. I mean, what not like force fed him, but like, <laughs> you know, left it out. Yeah. So. Oh my god, yeah. I love it. I love it. Absolutely brilliant. I used to have a cat that was more dog than cat. So I mean, I, and I am a huge, huge cat person. Um, so yeah, my grandmother had 300 cats and one rooster that ruled all of the cats. It was mental. We are all like genetically cat people. My son is already obsessed. But uh, no. yeah, anyway, right. I'm so sorry. Complete tangent. Yeah. Tell everyone a little bit more about you and your writing journey and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I started off, uh, like in my bio, I started off coaching, um, you know, organizational alignment. And uh, the degree that I have is um, part like organizational leadership and part, uh, um, I guess I call it psychology right? It's like, how are you successful? How do we make someone into a person who can have success? And um, so I was doing that long before I started writing. And then I actually started writing fiction because I got fired. Um, I mean, I was writing fiction before this, but I was like, well, might as well try because I have a severance package. And so like I I started writing fiction and um, uh, laid off, fired, whatever. Anyway, um, and and I, I started making money at it because it was in a time when, you know, the indie market was really, uh, really good. And so um, I started coaching authors sort of because people would come to me, like not intentionally. I didn't I 
I definitely did not get into this to become an author coach. Um, it was more, uh, I had a skill set and um, authors have a business that they run and not a lot of authors think of themselves as business owners. And so some of the stuff, yeah, some of the stuff I was, uh, that I would do with organizations, it'd be like, well, let's align you for, you know, who's on the bus and how do we get everybody in the right places and stuff. And I found that authors did not naturally think of that stuff, like HR stuff. And so I was like, well, I can help with that. And uh, I started coaching because people asked me to. And then it just kind of like literally ballooned from there, which is great. But um, I, I didn't do it intending to do that. <laughs> But the most wonderful things always come out of those, you know, serendipitous. Um, Serendipity. Yeah. Uh, my background was also in psychology, which is why I think um, there were certain chapters of yours that really appealed. Other ones made me like, oh, you know, <laughs> we'll get into yeah. that later. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, there was definitely it was some of the um, testing and stuff I was very interested in. I'm a huge fan of Myers-Briggs, so... Um, yes. But one of the things that you said I just wanted to talk about was um, authors not seeing themselves as business people, which yeah. I think is, I mean, especially for those writers who want to make a business. Oh, no, no, sorry. No, yeah. no. Those a writers living. who want to make a living. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those people who want yeah. to quit their jobs. I mean, honey, what are you doing yeah. if it's not a business? You know, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. minute you make a sale... You have a business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, you're a lottery winner, right? Yeah. Like, if you're not a business person, you're a lottery winner. Yeah, and we all know what yeah. the odds of that are. Yeah. Um, okay, so the reason I asked you on the podcast was because I recently read one of your books, Dear Writer, You Need to Quit. It is a very controversial title, which I love, yeah. obviously, with my rebel yeah. nature. Um, yeah. But before we scare any listeners off, could you tell everyone a little bit about the concept behind it and what that title really means? Yeah, so I definitely don't want people to quit writing, right? Like, I don't want... Well, that's not true. If you want to quit and you need permission to quit, then go ahead and quit. It's fine, you know? Um, but for most of us, it's we don't want to have to quit writing and we want to figure out how to keep doing it. And so what do you need to quit doing if you are not going to quit writing? So basically, like, you can't do everything. I'm sorry, but it's not possible. And so what do you need to quit if you're not going to quit writing is kind of I guess that's really the big core concept behind the book. Absolutely. And it is one of the best tough talking books I've read in a while because I mean you do not beat around the bush you tell everyone you tell them how it is you know I mean yeah. if anybody's listening and they need a swift kick up the backside this is the yeah. book for you <laughs> and yeah. I will be yeah. linking to it in um the show notes oh, so one of the things I loved about your book was the concept of always questioning our internal assumptions. We make a whole shitload of assumptions, you know, and we just assume that these assumptions are correct and we all know what people say about assumptions. So yep. can you talk to me a little bit about questioning the premise and our assumptions um, and the delightful little phrase that I read in a very sarcastic um, voice, but do you? Yeah. But can't you? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I literally, that is how I read it every single time. <laughs> yeah, that's how I say it. Like, yeah. uh, um, so it's often when uh, somebody comes to me for coaching and they'll be like, okay, Becca, I need to write 12 books a year. And I'll be like, but do you? Yeah. I'm like, really? <laughs> Are you sure? And, and not that I think uh, it's bad to write 12 books a year, or writing fast is bad or anything like that. But usually the people who struggle with it they struggle for a reason. And it is not because they're stupid or lazy. It's because there's something else going on in their head that makes it hard for them to write fast or to write, let's say, to turn around product quickly if we're talking in business terms. Um, and, and everybody's brain is very, very different. And we don't think about what that means when we as assume or accept assumptions about what we should be doing. And so it's like, you know, somebody says, I did this. And we think, okay, great. That's what successful people do. And so I should do that. Mm -hmm. And literally, I always say to everyone and every question, I'm like, but, but do you like, do you have to do that to be successful? Not because I think you don't, 
but because if the only thing driving you to do that is because somebody said you should, then yeah, you should not listen to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think also, um, you know, because I've I've done that, I I need to write faster, I need to write more words. And actually, all that happens is you end up hating writing. Yeah. And that's not healthy or either. Slower. Yeah. Or writing slower. Or exactly. Writing like, that's the crazy part that we don't think about is we think like, um, we don't think about what the assumption is doing to us. We don't always consider the cost. It's like, okay, I got to write fast. How do I do that? Let's go and take every single productivity class in the entire world. And literally, I have people come into my class who are like, oh, I've taken that. I've taken that. I've taken that. I've taken that. And I'm like, and you never thought to question the premise of whether you should be trying to write fast or not. Like you've literally tried everything and you can't just give up that premise, right? So that's one of the tough talks mm. is... Because people don't want to hear that. They want to write faster, you know? But but if that doesn't work for you and your brain, then maybe you just shouldn't write faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And maybe there are other things that you're better at that you should be focusing your time on instead of beating yourself up for just not being able to write 45,000 words a day. Like... <laughs> Not everybody can do that, you know. <laughs> we can all dream. No, I yeah. just, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what are some of the most common things that writers need to quit the premise or uh, quit, quit, quit doing or quit? Yeah, um, you know, what are words this evening? You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Question. <laughs> yeah. The thank you. Um, so, some of the biggest ones. I mean, the first big one is because a successful person did it, that means anybody can do it. And, and the part of the issue is that most successful people don't take their success as seriously. And they say things like, um, uh, if, if I can write 10,000 words a day, anybody can because it's so easy for them to do. And so they think, well, it must be equally as easy for everyone else. And then they set that expectation for the other writers to say, um, if you're not hitting this mark, then you're not going to be successful. And that's the assumption we make. Again, it's not the assumption that the successful people put on us. It's an assumption we make based on how we assimilate what success means. So the biggest, biggest, biggest premise that people don't question is that people are successful because of the program or the process that they used instead of based on their personality alignment with the process. Mm -hmm. So somebody who does dictation, for instance, has a particular type of personality that makes dictation really successful for them. And there are people for whom if you try to teach them how to dictate, they will literally stop writing for months, months. So question the premise instead, right? Like mm -hmm. it's possible that the person's success is not replicatable for you. And that's hard. It's hard to hear. But would you rather hear the truth or would you rather that I lie to you and make you spend money on my productivity stuff? Right. Like, Absolutely. I guess that's kind of the bottom line, you know. And the thing is, is that we're not that is not the only model of success. There are as many, you know, as many successful authors as there are paths to success. And I guess yep. the thing here is about finding that thing that is uniquely you and then yep. doing it a lot. Yep. Um, yep. As much as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. What's the most uh, common unrealistic expectation that you come across when coaching writers? I would say uh, this is going to be painful because I think that <laughs> you probably know what's coming. You probably know <laughs> what I'm going to say. Um, I think the most unrealistic expectation is that everyone is capable of equal amounts of success. Like it is unfortunate that that's just not the truth. Um, but it really is. It really is true that not everyone is equally capable of the same type of success or even just like somehow it's easier for us to conceive of this. Not everybody has the same amount of free time. And granted it's because you made choices. Like you chose to have, you know, commitments or responsibilities or whatever. I mean, not all of us choose to have a job. We can't hand, you know, uh, can't choose not to. But we have a life that is set up in a certain way that dictates how much time we have. And that is a very, very hard truth to swallow that if you don't have the free time to get done what you need to do, then you're not going to get it all done. 
And is it better to try to do the unrealistic thing or is it better to try to model yourself to be as successful as you can given what you can expect from yourself and then grow from there, right? Like everyone is capable of growth and everyone is capable of more success than they have, but not everyone is capable of the same type of or level of success. And that is super painful. Like I, I hate saying it out loud because I know people are just going to get mad about it, but I'm like, well, but let's look at, you know, statistics, history, everything is against you. you so know? I have a, a phrase that I like to use on this podcast, and I'm desperately trying to get some mugs with it on. But the phrase right. is, I think you're going to enjoy it. Suck it up, princess. <laughs> like, yeah. At the end of yeah. the day, you know, it is true. Um, but nobody, and this is, you know, I'm going to come back and say this again, but nobody is saying that you can't be successful. Because at the end of the day, yeah. what is your definition of success? Because no, yes. people don't don't have the same level aren't capable of the same levels of success but not everybody wants the same type of success either exactly and yep. you know and that is far more important if you can define what success looks like to you then you know what you're aiming for so why do you think us because i'm i don't know if this is just creative people or whether this is universal but why do you think we're all so resistant to hearing um these things and questioning the premises that actually are detrimental to us yeah, I've thought a lot about this because my this book that I just finished writing, which is a follow up to Dear Writer, You Need to Quit. I Ooh. talk about um, the the dream that a lot of us grow up with is we have this picture in our head that drives us that is like this dream that we have. Right. And we're so encouraged and especially in in the United States, it's like the dream, the bootstraps, the American dream. You know what I mean? And so there's this sense of if anyone says anything against my dream, that they're somehow they don't want success for me or they don't want me to be happy or whatever. And 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 my point is, if you are going to be disappointed because you didn't accomplish that dream, if you're going to look back on your life and think your life was worthless because you didn't accomplish this thing, wouldn't you rather be able to look back on a life that you're happy with and proud of? that was more realistic. And, 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 and again, this is a personality thing. Not everybody's wired this way. So some people are really going to balk against that and that's okay. I'm glad those people exist because they'll continue to encourage everybody to follow their dreams and look out for their dreams. And I think we need that also, but we also need people who are going to say, okay, but if you don't hit it, it's not because you are stupid. It's not because you're broken. It's not because there's something wrong with you or you're a failure. It's because it's normal. It's just normal mm -hmm. to, to overshoot. But I really think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we assimilate happiness with like we, we have a picture of happiness and we don't understand how to reframe that um, for ourselves. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> there are lots of things when you do go full time that aren't always <laughs> amazing oh, let's be awesome. honest yeah so yeah. I, I I left my job in April May time I haven't quite got to the end of my first year yet and <clears throat> you know it's been a roller coaster there are some amazing days where I am literally hysterical with elation and joy and then there are other days yep. where I'm like what the fuck did I do this is yes. terrible <laughs> you know yeah so every dream it, you know if I could merge the grass is not greener with every g you know every dream some you know they're not all parts of your dream are amazing I think at the end of the yes. day everybody has shit things in their day job yes um <clears throat> yeah, no, not all dreams are dreamy right like yes. it's not a fantasy <laughs> it's reality yeah and, and I think we deal with it so much better. And again, this is about unrealistic expectations for me, because when you hold them, like if I hold an unrealistic expectation in my head that my job should always be fun, well, the reality is it's not going to be fun all the time. So if you expect it to be fun, it's going to not be fun and you're going to be pissed about it not being fun. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be easier to just expect it to not be fun sometimes and then at least it'll only not be fun and it won't also be pissy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, 
Exactly. It seems so logical to me, but I guess, I don't know. Absolutely. And I think this comes into another one of the chapters where you say, you know, look at the past and look at the history. Um, You know, how hard was it to get to the point where you could leave your job? You know, you had to work bloody hard to get there. You know, what were you expecting it suddenly to be easy? I don't know if I was. Maybe I was. I think a little bit of me was, you know, but we we then learned the reality rather fast. Um, But yeah, exactly. Okay, so this is a awesome segue into my next question which is sort of a two-part question so I want to talk about reality um I found chapter 14 which talks about reality the hardest to read however Mm. I did read it this morning and was like what was I moaning about but anyway uh, at the time I think the first time you hear it it's not fun it was not fun I felt so called out I was hormonal it was I was you know it was hard it was hard I am legitimately sorry about that by the way (laughs) I hate doing that to people but I also am here like so yeah yeah it's not fun yeah no no but so let's tell i will explain briefly uh, obviously without you know going into all of it but <clears throat> in the chapter you talk about uh reality and the market and how you know we need to get real uh with our expectations and our view of the market and the fact that most books don't sell um i think you're so i wanted to bring up one specific statistic which i think you said was each 2.99 dollar book has a 1.4 percent chance of earning more than 2300 dollars a year which means most writers will not earn enough money to quit their jobs to write um or certainly not with one book anyway um which is why you advocate not quitting your day job as soon as it's possible for you to quit your day job um and also i think the whole just work harder concept is a bit of bullshit there um so tell everyone a little bit about the reality of writing and publishing and what they're up against if they really truly want to make a career out of this yeah it really is for me about resilience it's not don't try it's don't expect Like if you expect that your book is going to make less than a thousand dollars because 90% of books make less than a thousand dollars a year, you know, in their lifetime. So if you expect that to happen, then you will be pleasantly surprised when it makes 2300 or if it makes 10,000, like you'll be pleasantly surprised. And the more times you do that, then you'll be able to quit your day job. Mm -hmm. And the more, uh, I guess, predictable, it becomes when you get more books over that 100,000 ranking mark, right? Because the when you're only selling a book or two a day, which is the top 100,000 out of seven plus million, like seven million and counting books, we're still only seeing about 100,000 that are selling one or more books a day. That's not a great metric right so most of the books and and I can't remember who it was that said this and so I hesitate to even bring it up but it just was so staggering like there still are millions of books on Kindle that haven't even been purchased one time like millions of books that haven't even been bought one time and I'm I'm assuming this will be none of your people who are listening to this (laughs) podcast I'm assuming that it won't because most people who take this seriously would start marketing, right? Mm -hmm, And so mm -hmm. they wouldn't be in that place. But even still, you're looking at an uphill battle. It is not as easy as the people who are marketing well make it seem. And that's basically just a good rule of thumb for everything. Anytime something looks too good to be true, it is. Anytime something looks easier than it should be, It is not that easy. It's that the people who are doing it have found a way to do it that may have multiple different sources. It may be because they've released a whole bunch of books. It may be because they have natural talent. It may be luck. It may be timing. There's there's many different factors to success. But the point is, I don't want people to be disappointed with how their books do and think that there's something wrong with them Mm. because their books aren't selling. No, most books don't sell. It's okay. Like, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, And I think that's what's so nice about your book is that it is about empowering writers to be okay with whatever they have and whatever they, whatever their, I can't think of the word, but whatever their 
thing that they get. Like that's never mind. I you know what I mean. They're yeah, their well, lot. Their lot. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Their yeah, wiring. And their lot. Yep. Um. Yep. So part B. We've talked about the shit bit. Um. So yeah. I wanted <laughs> I wanted to talk that's a little a bit. Great way to put it, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it is. Let's be real. It you really know. is. Yeah. yeah. Um. So let's talk about the good bit and what they can do if an author is determined to make a go of this what can they do to set themselves up for success in the long term you really need to know what you're good at like you really really need to know for your for your personality and also for you as a writer like craft wise and like you need to look a lot at your alignment which if you think about your spine and how when your spine gets out of alignment, it's like you, it's painful, you walk differently, like, and then all of a sudden you get your spine, you crack your back and it's like, oh, I can live again. This is what living is like, right? That same thing happens when you understand who you are as a person. What can you expect of yourself? What's realistic to expect from somebody who ha- who is wired the way that you are? You know, if you are a person who needs to think more than other people, then that's going to be part of your writing process. You can't expect that you can stop thinking and write faster. Like you have to think better in order to get faster and not to stop thinking. So if you're a person who does that, then you use it as a strength instead of trying to get rid of it. There's so much of our thinking about success that is really skewed. Like we have an assumption that there is a model for how everyone is successful out there and all we need to do is conform to the model. But if you assume there is a model, it's not that there's one, it's that there's a thousand and there are a thousand different ways to be successful. And if you can find the one that's right for you, find a person who's more like you Mm. and then, and for how do you do this if you're determined is you keep getting better. Like you keep looking for the places where you can stand out and shine and meet reader expectations and write great books. And and you may have to release some of the unrealistic expectations. And you can't see how uncomfortable I just got (laughs) because you can't see the video, but I just got uncomfortable because releasing unrealistic expectations sometimes means like I may not be a fast release right to market writer. Or I may not be a Pulitzer Prize winner. Mm. Like there are, there is a range of different levels of success and you want to find the one that you can most realistically shoot for mm. and then shoot for that <clears throat> over and over and over again until you hit it. I, I, I love this. I love this so much because it's about personal empowerment and yep. um, each writer finding the thing that they, and this is, this is what, and the more I listen to you and obviously rethinking about the book, it's actually easy to spot the things that um, you work well with because nine times out of ten, they're the things that you like and enjoy doing. Yep. So it makes it exactly. very actually easy yeah. to do those things. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> yep. But people are so surprised when they come into my class and they're like, well, you know, I, I have this problem where I think all the time between my books. And I'm like, that's not a problem. It's a strength. <laughs> And like, and and we'll be like, well, what I really want to do is I want to go for a walk before I write, but I know I'm supposed to sit down and write. I'm like, no, go for a walk. Like your natural inclination is to do things that help your strength, like your personality strong parts. Mm. They are naturally trying to get you to do what you should do to be more aligned with them. Mm -hmm. And so a lot, so much of it is letting people do what they do. Like instead of outlining you pants because you like the exhilaration of not knowing what happens next. And then you're like, Oh, well, but to get faster, I need to outline. And I'm like, no, you don't. You need to get better at pantsing. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah, and yeah. it's so funny because I um, I'm now looking at my computer screen for those listeners who obviously cannot see us, and I have on my computer two reminders that say you have permission, because I think so many of us 
get caught up in you know exactly what you're saying we think we have to do something because either somebody else has done it or you've made this we've internalized an assumption and actually you have permission to experiment and I think the other thing that we often forget is that we change as humans all the time yes our innate um you know core traits and and personalities don't particularly change but our methods and systems can change you know when before I had a kid I was able to write until two o'clock in the morning because I wasn't going to be woken up at 6 a.m you know yeah. um, now i can't do that anymore yeah <laughs> you know so yep. you you not only do does everybody listening have permission to experiment and to enjoy the things that they enjoy you know you can enjoy those things guys it's okay to enjoy yes. the things you enjoy yes. um yes. you have permission to change your mind and to experiment and yep. to, ch- to try a different system as well I had something else I wanted to ask you, but um, it's vanished out of my brain, as so many things do now post-child. Um, <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Mom brain. Yeah. Yep. They, they lied. They said that went, you know, once they were yeah, toddlers. No, they it lied. Doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> what are the most important or biggest, uh, you know, mindset things an author can do um, in order to be successful? I would say... Um, get really familiar with the question, the premise method, like the QTP, uh, what, what I call QTP, right, which is anytime somebody tells you that you should be doing something or that all successful authors do this or whatever, you always, always, I don't care who says it, I don't care if it's Stephen King, I don't care if it's me, I don't care who it is, you always question the premise. Because for every 80% of people that it works for, there's 20% of people that it doesn't. And so here's a big one, because we're going into the new year into 2020. Um, everybody's buying planners, because planners make you productive. But do they? They don't. <laughs> they don't make people productive. They help people who are already productive with planners be more productive. And the rest of us, they piss the hell off all the time. And we buy planners trying to find the right one that's going to magically make us productive. And what I say is, okay, look back in your history. Has a planner ever made you productive before? No. Well, there's not a good chance that there's going to be a magic one out there that's going to make you productive. There's a better chance that you have a different way of being productive than by using a planner. And let's figure out what that is, right? Mm -hmm. So like for me, the mindset shift of don't ever buy the banana oil is such a huge deal. You always question the premise of everything. So I feel called out again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all of us uh, do I'm yeah, yeah i i so i'm a i'm a well i'm ei border but predominantly entj so planning oh no structure works well for me i was gonna say yep structure works well for me not necessarily planning however i have tried possibly four times to plan 2020 and my brain's just like nope fuck you, you can have goals, but you can't have a plan. I try to map time to tasks to, to, and I just, I am, I am so resistant and I'm, yeah, so resistant. And I'm like, why can't I do this? Why can I not just, you know, set a date? It's also deadlines. I try and set a deadline and I will Uh, immediately rebel against that deadline. Like I just, it is, it is, as soon as I try and impose a rule on myself, I'm like, well, I'm going to do everything I possibly can not to, to hit it now. But yeah, yeah. wow. Mm, okay, maybe I don't yeah. need to plan then. Just... You don't. I mean, so you, you would be much better finding the thing that makes you excited to work every day mm. and focusing on that, right? It's like, what makes me excited to get up and do this next day of work? Because the, the structure part can be as easily... Um, decided in the moment as it can be imposed from four months from now it does it definitely doesn't need to be especially if you find that you're better off if you don't know what's coming and then all of a sudden you're like all right I'm going to work for the next four hours and then it's like why well, I, I don't have time to get mad about that because mm-hmm. I need to do it right so like there's all this stuff about knowing yourself and how you respond to pressure and how you respond to time and stuff like that that's just so important for Mm. us to know Mm. any i guess tips and tricks other than um writers 
uh, being cognizant of what they enjoy. Any tips and, or tricks for writers to try and work out what things suit them better than others? Yeah, I love to use personality metrics. Like I just like to have a place where I can say, um, and I'll caveat this in a second, but where I can say there's a continuum between this on one side and this on the other side, and I fall here. And what that means is if, if we're looking at like objective versus subjective thinking, for instance, that has an impact where you fall on that continuum has an impact on how you respond to being surprised by things. And so if you are an objective versus a subjective thinker, it's important to know that. But the caveat I'll make is that any individual test is only as accurate as it is valid. And I, and I mean, uh, it's only as predictable or predictive as it is scientifically valid. So there are some that are more predictive than others. But I like, I basically like using all of them. I mean, we use everything that I can get my hands on, especially if there's a question we can't figure out about somebody. It's like, well, there has to be a way to measure that brain function. So let's talk about that. So everything from motivation to time sensitivity to introversion and extroversion to uh, creativity to strong uh, success metrics, right? Like I want to use everything I can get my hands on to figure out what I can reasonably expect of myself. And um, I'm a huge fan of objective testing because I think that it's so much easier when someone else has made a, a prediction based on what they've seen in patterns, um, especially if it's backed up by research, which again, I prefer the ones that are backed up by research. Um, but I think everything is useful as a starting point, as a starting point. Amazing. Yeah, I think <clears throat> we are, we all find it difficult to be objective about ourselves. Yes. <laughs> yep. You know, and, <laughs> yes. and that is really at, at the heart, at the end of the day, that is the heart of uh, dear writer, you need to quit because it, 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 it is the assumptions that we are unable to be objective. It is our subjective uh, <clears throat> opinions that we are unable to be objective about. Um, yes. yep. <clears throat> okay. I also felt pulled out <laughs> by the burnout chapter. Now, yeah. I am really, really, really good at burning myself out. I am like a pro expert at burning myself out. Yeah. So I collapsed two months ago because I mm. literally burnt myself out. Uh, yeah. yeah, wasn't cool, was a bit of a wake up. Um, yeah. However, I'm a workaholic. I love what yeah. I do. And not only am I not great at self-care, it's also actually really hard to stop doing the thing that you love. However, yeah. burnout is wildly inefficient. Yes. Which is, I cannot abide inefficiency. So that is why I absolutely wanted to ask you about burnout. Just talk to me about burnout, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think for me, um, there are definitely certain personalities that are going to tend towards burning harder and hotter. And if you can make sure that you're creating as much energy as you use uh, um, most of the time, right? Because our the reason we burn out is because we reach the end of our ability to create enough energy for ourselves to do all the things we've committed to doing, right? <gasps> so <sighs> my yeah. brain just exploded. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So if if we can make sure to do the things that give us energy and make energy for us, then it's much, much easier either to deal with. So I talk about burnout metaphorically as though it has a slope, right? So when you slide down into burnout, it can either be really, really like a 90 degree angle, or it can be like a 140 degree angle, right? So um, some of us are just going to head that way anyway. So the more we can do self-care on a regular basis, and this is things like sleeping, uh, get drinking enough water, like a ton of us are overtired because we're dehydrated. Um, and that's because we over drink coffee and under drink water. So if you are resistant to stopping drinking coffee, which I understand because it is, it is, well, I won't go there, but yeah, so coffee Life juice? Be, yes, yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. um, or tea, right? Yeah. Um, but even if you are going to still continue to drink the same amount of coffee, drink twice as much water as you drink coffee. 
um, just to make sure that you stay dehydrated. So much of our tiredness on a day-to-day basis is from not drinking enough water. And so um, so things like very, very minimal self-care. If you are a person who feels the need to read a lot, you probably make energy from reading and it helps you to write better books. Don't cut out your reading. Like so many of us look at our daily hours and we think that all of our minutes are equally up for grabs to do things like writing or working and they're not. Like we need the time to make the energy so that we won't overspend and then burn out because that's what makes us burn out is when we reach the end of our energy stores Mm. and we can't produce any more because we're not making enough. Um, I talk about it in terms of pennies, right? Like you spend a thousand pennies of energy a day and if you don't, and then you make a certain amount from sleeping and from drinking water and taking care of yourself and uh, watching Netflix and things like that. And if you don't make enough, then you have a store that you use up And once you get to the end of the store, you can only make as much as you can make from the normal stuff and you don't have any more. And that's what causes the burnout to happen. Yeah. I feel like I've had about 8,000 epiphanies right now because (laughs) I don't even know where to begin with this. First of all, I feel like you have given me permission to be my high energy self because I am an exceptionally high energy person. I burst everything. So some of my friends call me a conniption. I, you know, I'm either a fit of rage or a fit of excitement. There's not really anything in between. Um, But it, it, it is so true. But also I have, you know, friends and family and loved ones who who say to me, you've got to slow down, you've got to slow down, because they love me. But actually, I'm like, well, no, I don't want to slow down, because I enjoy being at that pace. And yep. just as I could, you know, I need to question the premise over what types of self-care I need to do in order to give me yes. that energy. Also, I need to question the premise that people are saying, you need to slow down. Well, no, fuck that. I don't want to slow down. I don't enjoy yeah, being slow. I don't need to. Like, and, and this is the other piece that I think knowing yourself is super important. So like there's a success metric called the Strengths Finder, um, which I use very, very extensively. And there's actually a strength called High Achiever where when you have it, you do not get de-stressed by stopping working. So like if you stop working, you get more stressed out, which Mm -hmm. costs more pennies than it produces. So like if you spend a whole day laying around doing nothing, all you do is expend pennies stressing out all day about the stuff that isn't getting done. And people who don't have that strength look at that behavior and think, "Um, I don't why can't you just slow down and not work? But the thing is, they get energy from working. So they still need to self-care. They still need to sleep. They still need to rest their body. They still need to take good care of themselves, but they don't need to stop working in order to make energy pennies. And and it's just a crazy, like, again, we internalize other people's systems. And I think that's the thing is when, when I'm not an achiever and I look at my high achiever friends or partners and say, if I was doing what you're doing, I would be exhausted. Mm. And I say, well, that's great. You're not me because Mm. I'm not exhausted by all of this work. I'm exhilarated by it. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm not stressed out, then you need to let me be the boss of my time and allow me. And and granted, if you are genuinely stressed out and you do need self-care, you have to slow down, but not, not to stop right? Mm -hmm. Just to do more self care and then get back into the ring again. Oh, this is so fascinating. I've had lots of people in my life call me an (laughs) overachiever. So I'm like lolling back here because I'm like, "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm." but yeah, I mean, so many epiphanies and I think it is so interesting. So my wife has chronic fatigue syndrome. So she is married to somebody who is like ridiculously high energy and she's obviously quite low energy. And so she will look at what I'm doing and she's like, I'm sat here watching you and I'm exhausted watching you do your stuff you know but we we make great balance but um yeah like it's it is it is fascinating um the psychology behind um you know actually embracing what other people might see as weaknesses as your strengths and then using those to do more of what you love best i yeah i i really hope everybody listening is having as many epiphanies as me right now (laughs) 
just on a side note too, if you could talk to your wife about your high achiever and, and literally like have her take the test, have her listen to it, see what her strengths are, see what your strengths are. And then you guys talk about them. I would be willing to bet that she worries about your stress level because she thinks this is what I would feel like because I don't have that particular thing. Right. Whereas if you can say, well, this is how I feel when I do all of this stuff. It's the same as how you feel when you get, you know, adequate sleep and you get like when you feel at your best, that's how I feel when I'm frenetically accomplishing things. And the way you can communicate because you then know how each other is wired. It's like you can start to appreciate that about each other and then it makes your relationship stronger. And it, I mean, literally, it's like the benefits are unbelievable. I'm grinning because she constantly says, I worry about the amount of stress <laughs> that you feel so um, yeah. So, yeah. And But I think it's because I talk about stress in perhaps a way that is not her perception and her experience uh-huh. of stress so I need to change the way or reframe what I'm saying because there's stress that I'm like oh I'm so busy I'm stressed you know and then there's yeah yeah and then there's actual stress and then there's like your heart is legitimately you're pursuing or you're producing cortisol yeah like there's that level of stress that's like that's negative stress yeah but when you have when you get energized by being busy and busyness actually does not stress you out. It doesn't produce the negative effects. Mm-hmm. There's a really big difference between those two things. You can be extremely busy and not stressed out. Yeah. But not everybody can do that, right? So, like, it's super important to say, hey, if you're not that person, I, I get that you're concerned about me. I promise you, if I feel that stress level, I will do something about it. And also... I'm committing to do better self-care so that I don't get to the burnout place. Because if you think of your plate size as being like you have a very big plate and it can be very, very full. And then there's this tiny margin on the outside and it doesn't take much to topple the margin yeah, and, and topple the plate but you can still operate at a very, very big plate size without toppling for a long time if you're making the right number of pennies and if you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. Oh, I, I need to re-listen to this uh, discussion about eight times yeah. because there's just so many gems in, here. It's in the burnout book. Like I oh, have okay. a book about burnout called Dear Writer, Are You in Burnout? And all of this stuff about plate size and pennies and stuff is all in there. I'm going to add that to the show notes as well. Yeah. <laughs> and definitely go and purchase it. Um, okay. This is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell me about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. So this one was fun to think about because I have a strength called individualization. And so I am rebellious about everything. I mean, as you can probably imagine about the QTP that came out of my brain, right? It's like, I just hate other people's expectations so much. Um, But actually... (laughs) I do a really specific thing and my, my one of my best friends is going to laugh when he hears this because I hate watching movies that everybody likes. <laughs> like when the movie comes out that everyone is obsessed with and they're like, oh my God, have you seen, you know, whatever it is at the time, right? Like Virgin River or Bird Box or like the thing everybody talks about, Aquaman or blah, blah. I'm like, fuck all of that. <laughs> that is I never ever want to see it it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of right like I get so angry about how much everybody else likes it and then I'm like screw it so this happened recently with all the Marvel movies I had never seen a Marvel movie oh my goodness like after all of the big hype and now this winter I'm like I'm gonna watch every single Marvel movie ever they are the best (laughs) like I watched Iron Man and loved it and Thor Ragnarok and now I need to see every single one of them. And, and my friend was like, you could have just watched them when they came out. Yeah. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> no. But would I? <laughs> but would I? Yeah. <laughs> right. um, no. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I love that so much. I, oh, that literally speaks to my soul. <laughs> I know, right? Um, okay. Tell listeners where they can find out more about you, your books, your courses, which I am now extremely interested in. <laughs> Uh, yes where can people find you go find me on the easiest places to come to youtube and to follow the quick cast q-u-i-t-c-a-s-t 
Um, Because that's all the free stuff. Like most of what we've talked about today is available just on those podcasts. You can just listen to all of them. And we talk a lot about success metrics. And and then we question a lot of the premises also of these major myths that happen in author success world. And uh, that's the easiest place. Um, Betterfasteracademy.com, all one word is where all the classes and uh, books and stuff, like all the links and everything are located there. But, but I would go to the YouTube channel and watch the quick cast because, um, especially when it comes to the author personality stuff, um, when it comes to strengths metrics, like I bring on authors who have those strengths and they talk about them from their own experience. So you can see like, here's like the very first one is about the thinking one intellection. And I say like, here's three successful people who all have intellection and let's listen to them talk about how they are successful using that trait. Mm -hmm. And then you get to see other people who are wired like you who talk about their success in a way that feels accessible for you as opposed to, you know, um, well, who knows if I can do that or not. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, So thank you very much to all of uh, our my patrons. Uh, Thank you to the listeners. I'm Sasha Black. You were listening to Becca Syme and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm going to be talking to Jay Thorne all about the three story method, which is his upcoming nonfiction book for writers. And I had the pleasure of reading an advanced copy. And guys, I am excited for you to both listen to this episode and also read his book about story structure. So that's coming up next week. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.